Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, my soul, praise Him, for He is thy help and salvation. All ye who hear, now to His temple draw near. Join me in glad adoration. Praise to the Lord who o'er all things so wondrously reigneth. Shelters thee under his wings, yea, so gently sustain. Of the, sea, of the depths of the sea, from the, of the, sea, from the, of the, sea, from the 
from the heights of the heavens. From the heights of the heavens. Your name be praised from, from the hearts of the weak. From the hearts of the weak. From the shouts of the strong. From the shouts of the strong. From the lips of all people. From the lips of all people. This song we raise, Lord, throughout the endless ages, you will be crowned with praises, Lord, most high, exalted in every nation, sovereign of all creation, Lord. Shouts of the strong, from the shouts of the strong, from the lips of all people, from the lips of all people, this song we raise, Lord, throughout the endless ages, you will be crowned with praises, Lord, most high, exalted in Sovereign of all creation, Lord, most high, be magnified. Throughout the endless ages, you will be crowned with praises, Lord, most high, exalted in every nation. Sovereign of all creation, Lord, most high, be magnified, be magnified, be magnified. Amen. Would you be seated, please? Good morning, church. This is a very, very special Sunday. We have been anticipating this day for quite a while. You have probably heard some people talk about it. You've maybe seen uh, a sign or a social media post or two, uh, all leading us to this very important day. Of course, I am talking about John Hodges' birthday. If only we knew someone who could sing. Happy birthday. I can't do it. Uh, no, uh, in addition to John's birthday, today is Global Missions Sunday. Um, this is a worship service. This is not a fundraising morning. This is worship. When Jesus' disciples came to him and they said, teach us to pray. Worship. He said, do not pray like the hypocrites do who go out into the courts and draw all the attention to themselves and use loud voices and big words. Instead, when you pray, go into your room and pray this. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Today is a worship service where we pray with our minds, with our hearts, with our words, but also with our treasure. We pray, may your kingdom come on this earth just as it is in heaven. Today, we worship by investing in the kingdom of God in this world. Because even though a return on an investment in the kingdom does not look the same as a return on a retirement account. The church claims that when we invest in the kingdom, God always 
returns that investment. God always is working for the kingdom to be on earth as it is in heaven. And so today, when we give not to our own communities, not to our own building, not to ourselves, but to places in this world many of us will never even see, we believe it is the most logical place for us to invest because the kingdom of God will come. God will not be defeated and wherever the name of Jesus is spoken, the kingdom of God is growing. And so we just want to participate in the inevitability of God's kingdom that is coming. And so we are mindful of our missionary efforts. We have missionary efforts in Guatemala where this year several of our members went to help restore communities and churches that have nothing. And we remember our efforts in the Ciudad de Angeles in Cosimo, Mexico, where children who have lost parents have basic needs met, community formed, the name of Jesus spoken into their lives, where those people, those children will not be forgotten. We invest in a new effort this year, Mission Lazarus, in a part of Honduras where many, many uh, people have completely forgotten. I remember first meeting uh, Rebecca's brother, uh, Jared Robinson, like almost 15 years ago. And the, the idea around Nashville at that time was, well, this guy's got a lot of energy and a lot of spunk, and he's got really high hopes, but let's see if he's still after it in a couple of years. Well, that was 15 years later. And he is investing in the kingdom, and so we will invest in him because God's kingdom will not be defeated. And about five years ago, this church said to the Gibbons and to the Hills and to the Dyes, if you leave family and home and your community and your friends and your culture, all for the sake of speaking the name of Jesus in Sao Luis, Brazil, we will support you. And today, we remember our covenant to them as it was to God, that if they make that sacrifice, we will not forget their investment in the kingdom of God. And so today is a worship service where we will gladly give what we have because God's kingdom across this entire globe will not be defeated, and it is our joy, it is our joy to put our everything into what God is doing everywhere. There's a video here from the dyes that uh, we need to see and we need to remember as we consider giving what we have to what they are doing across the world. Bem-vindos à família em Cristo. Fazer missão é criar uma comunidade que reflete o caráter de Jesus. Por isso, este vídeo não é sobre o que nós fazemos, mas sobre quem nós somos. Nesta cidade, a obra do Espírito Santo é manifesta e nós traduzimos como missão São Luís, Brasil. Ser uma família em Cristo significa confiança. Criação. Refúgio, aconchego. Felicidade. Vida. Comunhão. Hospitalidade. União. Carinho. Casa. Unidade. Gratidão. Renovação. Partilha. Aprendizado. Amor. Cumplicidade. Família. Discovery is a fun and meaningful way that we serve and engage our community. The plan for Discovery is pretty simple. We first serve by teaching English with the beautiful lyrics of a Christian song. As our guests arrive from all over San Luis to speak English, the warm reception they receive from our church family often leads to conversations about life, family, and faith. Discovery is our way to lovingly serve our community and invite them to discover a warm and welcoming faith community growing in Christ together. Growing together in Christ here at Familia in Cristo happens in our small groups and in our homes. Traditional small groups share moments together with studies, games, and food in a relaxed environment that deepen our relationships with members and visitors. Our men's and women's discipleship groups also meet weekly. In these groups, we commit to 25 weeks of learning, discussing, and practicing what it truly means to be a disciple of Christ. 
Workshops are a three to four hour event held several times a year, designed to allow members to deepen understanding in one particular area. This year we held workshops on ministry team dynamics, untouchable sins, and evangelism. Engaging in these deep discussions and self-reflection continue to create great opportunities for us to grow spiritually and as a family. Aos domingos, a igreja se reúne para adorar a Deus. Nossas celebrações exaltam Jesus Cristo, são fundamentadas na palavra, cantamos louvores que se transformam em oração no nosso coração. Nossas pregações são em séries. As últimas foram sobre o Evangelho de João, e agora, atualmente, estudamos a Carta de Paulo aos Romanos. Nossas celebrações são traduzidas em pessoas que amam a Deus, amam o próximo e desejam ser transformadas à imagem e semelhança de Cristo. A vida em Cristo significa alteridade. Convivência. Confraternização. Paz. Mudança. Segurança. Amizade. Plenitude. Massa. Serviço. Espiritualidade. Comunidade. Significa descanso para mim. Support. Generosidade. Gratidão. We have no greater joy than celebrating new life in Christ with our brothers and sisters who express their faith in Jesus through baptism. Obrigado, Jesus, por me amar tanto. E está sempre comigo. Amém. Seja aqui no Brasil. Seja aí nos Estados Unidos, a nossa missão é cumprirmos a grande comissão de dizer ao mundo que Jesus é a resposta para o coração humano. Se você quer saber o que está acontecendo na nossa igreja em real tempo, follow our Instagram at Família em Cristo SLZ. Thank you for supporting us in our mission to bring more people to Christ. Oh, is that not exciting? Is that not some good news? And it's just a small taste of what God is doing through Familia in Cristo in San Luis. There is so much more. I wish I could just put you all in a suitcase and take you there to meet those people and experience what he's doing in that city. It's striking to me that five years ago, uh, none of that existed. Those people didn't know each other. They weren't connected. Those stories hadn't been written yet. God had not started weaving their lives together. Global Missions is about God doing more than we could ever imagine. I remember sitting in a training meeting, and they asked us, so which one of you guys is going to preach on Sunday mornings when you open up? And we said, I don't know, uh, our prayer is that God will provide, uh, or maybe one of us will do it. And they said, okay, well, who's going to be the song leader? And we said, definitely God is going to have to provide on that one. <laughs> and he did so much more, so much more. Now, today, like David said, we're celebrating our global mission efforts. We're going to get a chance to give to those global mission efforts um, the kids are going to get a chance, and you're going to see them. They're going to run down, and they're going to chunk their money in the bucket with smiles on their face, and they're going to be giving high fives. They're going to be singing, like I think it was Jasper this morning, loud and proud and with all that they have. And as adults, we're going to get to do the same, probably in our more uh, reserved way. Uh, but I'm not asking you this morning to pensively consider how you can participate in these global mission efforts. I'm asking you to, even if it's not outwardly expressed, to give with a high five and a big smile attitude with the joy that David talked about because we get to, we have the privilege of participating with God on what he's doing in lots of different places across the globe. Now, Lucas said in the beginning of the video that mission is about creating a community that reflects the character of Jesus. Amen, right? God calls that community his family. And you heard members of Familia in Cristo share words that represent to them what it means to be part of God's family. And we have our words too. 
And the beauty of the diversity of those words is that the many words make up the one word, family, God's family. The church in Guatemala that the recent short-term mission trip went on, they get that idea. Uh, I was talking to Troy at family retreat last week, and he said that they completed their week's plans early, and so God provided more opportunity to bless the local congregation there. And so they built walls on their worship space, but they completed that task early too. And so God gave them more opportunity for blessing. And the project that the church came up with was for members of Northside to work with members of the Guatemalan church to create a sign that says, you can't read Spanish, family. They wanted their local family to be represented by hands of their Guatemalan brothers and sisters next to our Northside members' hands on a single sign that communicates what's important to them and what's important to God, family. And so our hands are next to their hands on their local church. That is what God does through global mission efforts, more than we can imagine, more to propagate this idea of unity and the many forming one family. And so it is our privilege to get to participate in that this morning. Northside has been involved in global missions for decades, supporting long-term missions like Fortaleza and now San Luis in Brazil, countless short-term missions to, I can't even remember, Ukraine and Burkina Faso and Mexico and Guatemala and now Honduras, and I'm sure there's lots of others that I've forgotten about. The question is, where will we go next? Where will he send us next to experience his more? My prayer this morning is that this family just continues to go. Thank you. We are here to worship our Lord this morning. I know that all of us have noise in the background of our brains. There are a lot of things going on in the world that command our attention, that focus us on things that are not always what they should be on. We're talking to God this morning, our Father, and I ask that every one of you make every effort you can to remove the noise and the busyness. Let's focus on who we are as the family of God. You'll pray with me. Almighty God, we approach you today both fearful because you are the God of creation. You spoke the universe into existence. We will never comprehend the mysteries of what you did in creation. You made us in your likeness. We will never understand all of the mysteries associated with that. You sent Jesus Christ, your son, to live among us, to take on each one of our sins. Lord Jesus, you took my sins that I continue to make, and you clothed me, you clothed this family in righteousness' sake. Father, we come before you this morning because we are grateful for that life we will have with you. We're grateful for your kingdom. Father, we recognize that we approach you through Jesus Christ, and that's the good news, not just to us, but to a world, a world that needs it. Help us to truly believe the power of of being in Jesus Christ is the way to our Father. And whether it is here in our our city or in our families, or today as we look at this large world, that we will be so encouraged and energized to share that good news. 
Father, we're grateful for this church family, uh, its generosity. There are so many things we're grateful for in this family, but the generosity continues to be amazing. And Father, may each of us go back and when we're praying along in our rooms or in our closets and asking for your spirit to lead us, that we will continue to show that generosity. We want the kingdom to be fulfilled here on this earth. And Father, our prayer is that every knee in the world will come to recognize you as God, the creator, the father, that we will all fall before you in amazement and in gratitude. Lord Jesus, please share this prayer. Lord God, that you will see us as your righteous children and smile upon us. Amen. Mighty is our God, mighty is our King, mighty is our Lord, He's ruler of everything. Glory to our God, glory to our King, glory to our Lord, He's ruler of everything, His name is higher, higher than any other name. word.
I will be reading Exodus chapter 7, 8 through 13. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, When Pharaoh says to you, perform a wonder, then you shall say to Aaron, Take your staff and throw it down before Pharaoh, and it will become a snake. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did as the Lord had commanded. Aaron threw down his staff before Pharaoh and his officials, and it became a snake. Then Pharaoh summoned the wise men and the sorcerers, and they also, the magicians of Egypt, did the same by their secret arts. Each one threw down his staff, and they became snakes. But Aaron's staff swallowed up theirs. However, Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he would not listen to them, as the Lord had said. This is the word of God for the people of God. I want to start today by saying thank you. Thank you uh, to this church for being a place that uh, does the family retreat that we did last week and a church that doesn't see a minister and his family as the help uh, or people that are tied to this building every Sunday morning, but even invited us and welcomed us to that family retreat to just be, be normal. Uh, that was a blessing. As normal as we can be, I should say. As normal... <laughs> As we can be, I want to say thank you to Jack for preaching last week. Uh, if you, amen. If you weren't here, uh, if you were at the family retreat and you have not gone back and watched the YouTube video of Jack's sermon, shame on you. What are you, what are you doing with your week? Uh, but but Jack spoke about this God, this Hebrew understanding of a God that is not primarily known as philosophical constructs, as arguments but personally, as a who, and as a who that is best understood through story, because that's how we experience and understand the world, through story. And this story is of a God who knows us, hears his people crying out, hears his people suffering, sees his people suffering. The question of Exodus is not, what does God do? It is not what is right and what is wrong. It is who is the Lord. It is asked by God's people and it is asked by Pharaoh and it is asked by everyone on the power paradigm. Who is the Lord? And the answer is a story. Two weeks ago, I asked you to think about your favorite story, specifically your favorite sports movie story. Uh, There was a poll. We all agreed. It was unanimous. It's Remember the Titans. There wasn't even a debate. Uh, This week, I want you to think of your favorite science fiction or fantasy movie. Like last time, you might be saying to yourself, I don't like that genre of movie. But you do have a favorite movie in the genre of movie you don't prefer. So think of your favorite science fiction or fantasy movie. One, two, three. We'll all say it at the same time. It's The Princess Bride. Right? It's The Princess Bride. Um, I've heard of like Marvel or I don't know. It's the Princess Bride. In every science fiction or fantasy movie, it relies on one consistent thing. It asks us to do one thing that we are all too happy to do. It is called suspending our disbelief. We are suspending our disbelief when we watch a fantasy or science fiction movie because it is going to be a plot chock full of things that we know can't happen. But we don't even ask the question, could that happen? Because we want to go along with the story. So in The Princess Bride, when the dread pirate Roberts puts on a mask and somehow no one in the story can figure out who this person is, even though it's so obviously the farm boy Wesley from the first 20 minutes of the movie, we don't even ask, why can't they, have they all suddenly caught face blindness? I mean, it's not even a full mask. And when he goes to capture, uh, to to, uh, liberate his princess and has to go through the gauntlet of dangerous things, we accept that there is a fire swamp, rodents of unusual sizes, and lightning sand, much faster than quicksand. We don't ask the question. We suspend our disbelief. This morning, to really understand this story of Exodus, we have to do the opposite. We have to suspend our belief. I need us to pretend that we don't know 
there are 64 more books in this Bible. I need us to sit there in the drama with Moses and Aaron and realize they didn't know how the story was going to play out. We need to suspend our belief for just a moment. We think that when Moses and Aaron go to war with Pharaoh and his magicians, that they're just doing like tricks. They're just doing cheap magic tricks, whereas God is really doing miracles. But that's not really how the story is told. The story is told in such a way that Egypt's primary export to the world at this time is magicians and magic. It's what they do better than anyone else. And magicians is kind of even cheap. When Pharaoh pulls out his his attendants, they are soothsayers, sages, magicians. Pharaoh calls out a full army of attendants that do magic And it's not telling us in the text, well, they're just doing little cheap tricks. No, 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 no. They seem to be able to match God's works. For a moment, if we can just suspend our belief, we will see how terrifying it must have been in that moment when Moses and Aaron throw down the staff because this has been their thing so far. Twice before, they have thrown down the staff and people have gone, as it becomes a snake. The power of God must be here. This was like their, their ace up the sleeve. But this time they throw down the snake, throw down the staff, and it becomes a snake. And then an army of Pharaoh's attendants come out and do the exact same thing. Yes, Aaron's staff swallows the other snakes. But what would that moment feel like? Well, there's a beat. There's a rhythm to this story. It's going to become predictable. It's going to become rhythmic. Beat one, God sends Moses and Aaron to demand Pharaoh let the people go. Beat two, Pharaoh says, I don't think so. Beat three, God tells Aaron to hold out his staff and do something Amazing, remarkable, magical, powerful. And through God's power, that staff does something shocking. Beat four, Pharaoh's magicians do the same thing. I need us to pretend for a moment that we don't know there are eight more plagues to come. What does it feel like right there in Pharaoh's palace? as God's power is met. Well, in fear, God sends Moses and Aaron back to Pharaoh a second time after after the snake-to-staff incident. This time, they're to go meet him down by the Nile. The Nile is godlike to the Egyptians. It's the reason why they have survived world famine after world famine after world famine. It is the very emblem of their world power. Pharaoh, maybe he goes down to check the water levels. Maybe he goes down to worship it. But they meet him there. And they say, let our people go, beat one. Pharaoh says, beat two. No, I don't think so. Beat three, God says to Moses, God says to Moses and Aaron, Aaron, hold up your staff over the Nile River. And then the Nile River turns to blood. Pharaoh's God dies. And all of the animals, all of the life that lived there in Pharaoh's God, it starts to die too. And the country, the land, stinks of death. And then, beat four, the magicians come out, the soothsayers, the sages, and they do the same thing. It's terrifying. So far, the power of God has begun to wake up. It's begun to claim its place. It's begun to challenge the world's most powerful person, the person who claims to be a god and no one even laughs or snickers. But so far, the power of Pharaoh continues to dominate. It matches everything God has been able to do. The one who has 
enslaved God's people, the one who's made their lives harder by now saying, you make your own bricks, the one who has tortured them. His power just feels so close. It's just so undeniable. It makes me wonder what kind of powers are undeniable to us. What kind of powers are just so near to us that we can't deny it? Uh, I have to take 281 South every day to get to work. I am convinced of the power of the Bayer County Sheriff Department. Sometimes, occasionally, with my Waze app up looking for potential police officers, I might exceed the 60 mile per hour speed limit of 281, which is slow. Can we just agree it's slow? It's 60 miles per hour is slow. Um, but when I see that police icon on my Waze app, I slow down because I believe in their power to pull me over. I'm not suggesting they're abusing their power. If I'm caught speeding, I deserve a ticket. But I don't ever question their power over me. It's real. It's there. It's near. I don't question the power of the United States military. I'm not even going to criticize the United States military. Don't worry. But as the war in Ukraine looks like it's going to reach at least 20 months long, maybe two years long, and as I read articles and I try to see at least some of the suffering that is happening in this world, I kind of feel bad of how comforted I feel by the power of the United States military. I know that that war will not reach our shores. I know, I believe that our children will not be drafted into service against their will. I feel strange to say, but I feel comfort in that power and its nearness. I feel comfort and I participate in and I know the power of capitalism. Kristen and I try to not spend more than we make. We try to live below our means. We try to be generous with what God has given us. But we have credit cards. We use them. And we save money every month. We put it into our own retirement accounts. We hope that one day, if we have grandchildren, uh, that we would get to travel to see them, to be with them, that we would get to retire one day. Every month, we participate and we invest in the power of capitalism and the free market that is near to us. And again, I'm not criticizing it. I'm not trying to take a cheap shot. I'm certainly not suggesting that our civil servants and the U.S. military and that capitalism is the same as Pharaoh. It's not. They are not explicitly anti-God. They are also not God. And sometimes I have to take a breath and check myself and ask myself, have I become seduced by the powers? Have I loved too much those powers that are so near to me and provide me with so much I cannot de deny the privileges I have because of these powers? I think, though, sometimes the church might need to ask, is there anything they can't do for us? Is there a limit to what their powers are able to do? Or, like Pharaoh's magicians so far in this story, are they able to do for us everything God is able to do? What I'm really asking is, can the church get to a place where we no longer need God to be all-powerful. Because the powers that have privileged us have become so near, they have won our hearts over, and we need nothing from God. Thankfully, the story does not end in a question mark. From this moment on, 
there will be no more question about power and where it lies. The story, thankfully, moves on, and there is a third plague. Uh, This plague begins to disrupt the rhythmic part of this story. There's the first beat that we've come to expect. Moses and Aaron uh, hear God say, go to Pharaoh and command him to deliver the Israelites that they might go worship me, but we just skip over Pharaoh's response. We just go straight to the third beat. We don't have a second beat. Immediately, Moses and Aaron are holding that staff over the Nile River again, but this time, frogs. Strange story, but okay, frogs. They come up, and they come everywhere. The, The rhythmic nature of the story shifts from Pharaoh and Moses and Aaron and the staff and Pharaoh's magicians, and it becomes where the frogs will go. They will jump out of the Nile. They will be in your house, in your room, in your couch, in your servant's house, upon your people, in your ovens. They will jump into your pans as you need bread. Frogs are going to be coming out of everywhere. And Pharaoh now does something totally uncharacteristic to the point where now we know we are singing a completely different tune. Pharaoh goes to Moses and Aaron and says, make it stop. Make it stop. I can't take any more frogs. Moses says to Aaron, Moses and Aaron say to Pharaoh, tell us when you want it to stop. And he says, as soon as possible. And they say, tomorrow morning the frogs will begin to die. And they do. And the stench of death again, like a herald of what is to come, becomes bearable. And then Pharaoh hardens his heart. And then the Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron, stretch out your staff and strike the dust of the land, and there will be lice in all of the land of Egypt. And thus they did. And Aaron stretched out his hand with his staff and struck the dust of the land, and there was lice in man and in beast. All the dust of the land became lice in the land of Egypt. And the magicians of Egypt did with their spells to take away the lice. But they were unable. And they said to Pharaoh, God's finger it is. Pharaoh begins this part of the story by asking, who is the Lord that I should be afraid of him? And today, His question receives its answer, but it does not come from the mouth of Moses and Aaron. It does not come from the mouth of the Hebrew slaves. It comes from the mouth of his own power. His soothsayers and sages and magicians, they say to Pharaoh, God's finger it is because God is powerful. We are unable to do it. God's finger it is. They say, Pharaoh, this God is a power you haven't even imagined yet. The spell has been broken. The reality runs forth. It it, it jumps forth like lice from that place. It bounces to the four four corners of Egypt, and it reaches the slums, the hovels, the dark places where there is no comfort, where the Israelites live. And they spread the good news that Pharaoh's power has been checked and they stop making bricks and they stop gathering straw and they say, we're not going to work for him anymore. I wonder what they began doing with their time. I bet they spent some time with their children. I'll bet They walked out of their door and reintroduced themselves to their neighbor. I bet they began building community again. I bet they rested from all of their hard work because the power of Pharaoh has been checked and the power of Pharaoh will never again match or even come close to matching the power of God because... For once, the power of Pharaoh is unable to match God's power. From this point on, the magicians of Pharaoh will never again come close to threatening God. It will be sign after sign 
uh, plague after plague, and Pharaoh again and again will ask to be relented from the suffering and then harden his heart. And then ask for, for forgiveness and then harden his heart. And so I want us to give ourselves permission here to stop our experiment. I want to give us permission to no longer suspend our belief, but not just now. The church must be the people that believe always in the power of God, the all-powerful name of God, because sometimes there are other powers that compete for our attention and our affections And we think that we always believe what we believe, but sometimes we do suspend our belief. The church has to be the people that believe in the power of God, and belief is not just a cognitive exercise. It is work. It is actions. It is community building. It is rest, often active rest. It is investing and the power of the kingdom of God because we believe one day it will be the only kingdom. Pharaoh will not restore communities and churches in Guatemala. Pharaoh will not care for children who have lost their parents in Cozumel, Mexico. Pharaoh cares nothing about the forgotten people of Choloteca, Honduras. And Pharaoh will not speak the name of Jesus in Sao Luis, Brazil. Pharaoh's magicians can do a lot of things. They can can create fear, they can abuse, they can coerce. But there is so much they can't do. They cannot build community. They cannot restore. They can abuse creational goodness, but they cannot practice justice, which is to do what God did in creation, that all creation would flourish. They can't do justice. Pharaoh's magicians can make us work. They can't lead us to rest. And so we remember the dyes in Sao Luis, Brazil. We remember what is happening in Guatemala and Mexico and Honduras because of all that Pharaoh can't do. Because of all that we believe the power of God will do. Today we invest not in ourselves, not in our own retirement accounts, not even in our own communities, but we invest in communities across the world that many of us will never see. Why? Because it makes sense if we believe. Because the most logical thing to do Because even though Pharaoh's power is often so near, we have to be the ones to remember all that it can't do. It can't save us. It can't restore communities. It cannot create communities of justice and love. Only the power of God can do that. And so today today we invest in the kingdom of God in San Antonio, San Luis, and Honduras and in Mexico, because just like the power of God reigned in Egypt as the very ground Pharaoh stood on shook and become lice, we claim that God is going to establish a kingdom in those places. And in this place, just like heaven, we invest in the kingdom of God because of all the power of God can do. The church does not merely speak about what God does. We invest in what God does. Power of God shows up in strange places. Today, our last thought will be the way the power of God shows up in an ordinary table. Invite us now to this table of mercy, table of love, a table of great power. Pharaoh can kill, or maybe we should say King Herod can kill, Pilate can kill, the religious authorities can kill. But all these people can't resurrect. They cannot bring dead men back to life. They cannot make communities of diverse people who all claim 
power of God's kingdom. So at this table, I want us to ask, who gives you life? Where do you get the really good things in life? Pharaoh's powers are close and undeniable and often comforting. But who makes a community of love and justice? Who has invited you to this table? Who has raised Jesus Christ from the dead? Only the power of God does that. And missions, both local and global, says the kingdom of God is coming. The kingdom of God will not be defeated. Missions, local and global, claims the mystery of our faith is that Christ has come, Christ has died, Christ has risen, and Christ will come again. And we are living for that kingdom now because the power of this table is that though Jesus walked from here to a cross, he walked from that cross, was brought from that cross to a grave, he walked out of that grave and now sits at the right hand of God in power. In power. We receive our power from the power of Jesus whose kingdom is coming. Church, will you take the bread and open it? And I want us to do something here. I want us to maybe a little bit strange, but would you hold the body of Jesus up, broken for you? Would you hold it up? Church, we hold this up as our power that Christ's body, though broken, And the power of God is mended, as will be our lives. Take and eat. Church, would you hold up the cup? We hold this up. We hold this up to the whole world. The blood of Christ shed for us is our power. We do not proclaim the goodness of ourselves. We do not proclaim our strength. We do not proclaim the strength of any man or woman. We preach Christ and him crucified. Because in the brokenness of our own lives, God's power restores. Take and drink deeply from the blood of our Savior. May the power of our Lord Jesus Christ go with you this week wherever he may send you. May he guide you in the wilderness. May he protect you in the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing once again from all he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again to these doors. Everyone needs compassion, love that's never failing. fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior, the hope of nations. Savior, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. Heroes
Jesus and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. Of the risen King, Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered I'd like to ask all of you, if you would, please, to take from the rack in front of you the card that says at the top, Missions. You already know our goal. Well, on the back of the card where it says Global Mission Sunday, I want you just to take note for the moment the three boxes. These are for Northside members. We're not asking any visitor of this family to participate in this contribution. This is our commitment and our goal. But I'd like to ask every family or every member, before we are done this morning, to be able to check one or more of these boxes. This is what I'm giving today through whatever means. This is what I pledge to give. 
before the year's out. And hopefully all of us can say, I commit to praying for the Northside mission efforts supported by Global Mission Sunday. From the earliest days of the church, in the days after Pentecost where the apostles preached in 3,000 souls from nations all over the earth were added to the church. And years before the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch, this movement of Jesus' followers were concerned about all nations and all people. This movement of disciples was never about an exclusive focus on the local church. They were never only concerned about themselves. In fact, if they had been, if their only focus had been on us, the Christian message would have died quickly. It could never have reached across the continents and across the centuries all the way to our hearts. From the beginning, Christianity was a global movement, first in Jerusalem, then in Judea and Samaria, and then to the uttermost parts of the earth. Northside has always been that kind of church, all the way to its beginning. This is the story of our church family. It is in our spiritual DNA. We have always been aware of the working of God, both in the neighborhoods near us and in places far away. We have always been visionary in joining God's work wherever we could. Because of it, many lives have been changed and many people have come to Jesus. Today is the day that we ensure that the commitments we have made around the world to the ongoing mission work of our team in Sao Luis, Brazil, to the short-term mission efforts in Mexico, in Honduras, and in Guatemala, will not just continue, but will thrive. I'm going to ask uh, the shepherds and ministers and whatever spouses may be here that will want to help to come to the front, and there are baskets here on each corner. If you will come, it'd be making your way and grab a basket and hang here with me for just a second. Come and grab one or more of these baskets, and you will have to figure out what aisle you want to walk down. Because we haven't practiced this. We have not rehearsed this part. But in just a moment, they're going to go, while we show a slide presentation, we're going to go and, and walk through the aisles, and if you want to pass your card, whatever you want to write on that card, write it, sign your name for yourself or your family. I suggest you fold it and either pass it to the end of the row or the baskets will be passed down the row and the cards will be picked up. And let me ask you, Tom, can you remember this? When, when you, Laura, if you'll help Tom remember, when, when you're done, Lisa is at the back of, the, of uh, uh, our worship center, and we're just going to dump what's in your baskets into that bag, and then your work will be done. Let me say this one final thing, and then I'm going to ask you during our slide presentation to walk through these aisles and to pick up uh, the cards uh, as our members complete them. Paul told the Christians in Rome, we do not live for ourselves. And we do not die for ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord. We are in a position today to fund the work that touches the lives of those who would not be touched if we only lived for ourselves.
Shall we be in prayer and concern and awareness of the power and the working of God in the world as we make our pledges or our statement of what we are giving today? Um, if you have a check, don't put it in the basket. Put it in the receptacles at the back of the room. You know the other ways that you can give, and there's a QR code if anyone needs to to give electronically today. Let's take a few moments and have these baskets pass through our worship center uh, as we continue our time of worship. If there's anybody who didn't uh, get your card into one of the baskets and you want to hand that card off to someone when worship's over, feel free to hand it to any of our shepherds or to one of our ministers when we're done, and we'll be happy to take that for you. Uh, this morning, uh, it's our first Sunday, so our kiddos are in here, and normally the change in money that goes in our bucket goes to one of our local missions. But this morning, as part of teaching our children that it's not just about giving locally, but it is about giving globally, um, everything we collect in this bucket will also go to, to our global mission Sunday. And we will be adding to that as well. So we want our kids to know it's not just about what's at home, but it's about all these kids that they've seen on these videos this morning. So as our kids come down, we're going to sing. And uh, if you've got some change in your hand and you'd like to hand it to one of those kids that comes by, let them bring it on down to this bucket. So come on, kids. He's got the whole world in his hands. 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 He's got the little bitty babies in his hands. He's got the little bitty babies in his hands. He's got the little bitty babies in his hands. She's helping. All right. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. What an incredible morning this has been. Is this just been amazing? Thank you so much for your generous hearts, your generous giving as we work toward getting out into this world and being the hands and feet of Jesus, not just here, but everywhere. 
Uh, just a reminder that uh, we want you to stick around at 10 o'clock, 10.30, it's after 10, 10.30 <laughs> for our Bible classes. We have adult Bible classes in several rooms, some downstairs, some upstairs, and we have Bible classes for our children ages birth all the way up through high school. So if you need help finding a class and you're visiting with us, grab one of us. We'll happy to show you where a class is. And one last reminder that ladies, today is the deadline to sign up for the ladies retreat. Uh, out in the atrium, there's a table. If you haven't signed up for the ladies' retreat, stop by that table. Let's stand for our last song. May our homes be filled with dancing. May our homes be filled with dancing. May our streets be filled with joy. May our streets be filled with joy. May injustice bow to Jesus. May justice bow to Jesus. As the people turn to pray.